Amen. And I'm really excited to share with you, it's an extended passage with you this morning, and I don't want us to miss the forest for the trees. In other words, we're going to have a kind of a sum a look at the whole thing in breadth, and we're going to look at some of the trees in the forest along the way, but this group of texts, to me, and you'll find this, I'm going to use this analogy throughout, so it opens up, kind of starts like walking into this foreboding forest, and that first section was full of threat, and it immediately opens up into this beautiful meadow of hope before finally giving way to uh, an old forest full of wise trees. But at the end of that old forest, we come to a high place, a bluff overlooking the world, and a meeting of the great conspiracy. The great conspiracy. We see conspiracies all over the place, don't we? It's like we're designed to see conspiracies. I hardly go a day without somebody talking about a conspiracy. Just it's, Something is happening out there because people conspire. That's what happens. So we all have conspiracy theories. This is far beyond a theory. You know, kingdoms are often built on conspiracies. Lots of kingdoms throughout the ages uh, emerge from some violent revolution, a coup d'etat, uh, some kind of conspiracy put together. You might think of people like Alexander the Great, um, American Revolution, or maybe even the Bolshevik Revolution um, when they killed the Romanov dynasty in Russia. All kinds of wild conspiracies really do happen. Now, the church has often adapted to such kingdom-building conspiracies and strategies. One of the wildest stories in all of history that kind of, if you read the whole thing, it's pretty interesting. One of the wildest stories unfolded on November 5th, 1605. This guy named Guy went, and he and a couple other guys, they, uh, they had this idea that they could overthrow the British monarchy. They were Catholics. They were tired of how the Catholics, I mean, the Protestants had been treating the Catholics. They despised King James, who, is, who gets the name from the King James Bible. He named that king, it's named after him. You know, that guy. So this guy named Guy Fawkes, or Fawkes, depending on your British accent, he, he was so angry that he and these guys, they went and they rented this, uh, this particular house where seller, the seller of the house extended out under the parliament building there in London, Westminster. And they, they got together. They're going to kill James. They're going to kill most of the government. They're, this is their big plan. But it was spoiled because somebody had sent a, a note to one of their brother-in-laws not to go to work on November 5th. And so he's like, hmm. He turns it into the authorities. And early, in the early morning of November 5th, 1605, Guy Fawkes was found in the Westminster cellar with a fuse, a box of matches, and 36 barrels of gunpowder. It's called, unimaginatively, the gunpowder conspiracy. Now, of course, they arrested him, tortured him, and executed all of his co-conspirators. That's how people build kingdoms. That's what we think. Even to this day, even on November 5th in 2024, I guess 23 they did, 24 they will. They celebrate a day they call Thanksgiving Day called Guy Fox Day. You just think that's the basis of Thanksgiving, right? That's, that's kind of wild that you're just thankful. It might be worth celebrating these days when two or more are gathered that there's not a big explosion. That's, that's, a, that's something to be thankful for. But this, this was true in Jesus' time as well. As Jesus and his merry band are making their way to Jerusalem this final time to hail Jesus as king, as we'll recall on uh, Palm Sunday, the disciples are a bit giddy with who's going to be the greatest. We talked about this last week. Co-conspirators with Jesus in this new kingdom. Can they distinguish themselves with bravery? Who will have the, the, the highest position, the most prestige and influence? And they ask Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom? That was the very beginning of chapter 18. But Jesus' grand plan was not to poison Pilate's dinner wine, nor to drown some Pharisee in the pool of Bethesda. Jesus said, oh, he put, last week we read, oh, you got to be like this child. You got to be like this kid. You have to be humble, powerless, and not needing to be noticed. And God's kingdom is going to be built on humility, even though kingdoms are usually established to promote me and mine, me and my people. 
He says, that's not what we're doing here. Because God's kingdom, main point, main point here, God's kingdom grows with a radical concern for others. God's kingdom grows with a radical concern for others. Whoever receives one of these child, one of these children, little ones, he calls them, and what he's talking about is anyone who is one of his children, not just children, children, that too, but anyone who is like a little child, anyone who's humble, any of his disciples, any follower of Jesus. He says, when you receive one of those, in my name, you receive, it's like you're doing it for me. How we treat and influence others is a key metric in God's kingdom. It's a key, it's key metric in the greatness. When you measure greatness in God's kingdom, kingdom greatness, disciplines, we start here, kingdom greatness disciplines itself for the sake of others. This first section is our foreboding forest. It works on two levels. First level is really in the day-to-day -day influence of others. Jesus offers this very direct warning for those who cause his little ones to stumble. You're better, you're better off tying a giant stone to you and throwing yourself into the sea than doing that. I mean, it, it's pretty dark. It's, pretty, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty thorough warning right there. The, this emphasizes, though, what Jesus is emphasizing is just how precious God's people are to him. He's saying, don't, you need to realize how precious these little ones, my disciples are to me, and you need to share in understanding just how precious they are. Don't make others stumble. And Jesus, Jesus uses this word stumble. The Greek word is easy to figure out when you see it, scandalon, where we get the word scandal or scandalize. Don't scandalize them. Don't make them fall. Don't, you're, by your behavior, your action, your teaching, scandalize them into going some wrong direction. And Jesus' phrasing certainly applies to, I think, intentionally misleading people. It absolutely is that. But the warning is strong enough when I read it. I think it's strong enough to warn us that ignorance is not really a valid excuse either. It's like you need to make sure if you're leading or if you're teaching people when you're behaving as one of my children, one of my representatives, one of, if you want to be the greatest, you need to be pretty parallel with what I'm doing, and that is learning. That's getting rid of things in your life that you don't have to. Here's the thing, personal holiness matters. Pers your personal holiness matters. If your feet, he says, if your feet make you stumble, cut them off. It isn't literal because the real problem is in our hearts, right? He isn't saying literally cut your feet off. He doesn't want us to start maiming ourselves. That's not generally what he's talking about. He's wanting us to understand the extreme for which we should be dealing and thinking about sin and destruction in our lives. Because sin is absolutely and utterly destructive. When you're, when you're walking in ways that he doesn't want, you're going to break. It might even break literally. You're going to get hurt. You're going to hurt others and you're going to hurt yourself. That's why sin is sin. It's not to keep us from having fun or doing things. It's to keep us in a line of health and wholeness, of love and of peace. We need a revolution, not around us or political. We need a revolution in the heart. He's, by doing all these things to ourselves. he's saying you've got to do battle with sin. You've got to really deal with it. It's a hard battle. That's part of the implication of this. Dealing with sin is not something easy. And you don't go to people saying, oh, just stop it. Just stop what you're doing. It's so easy to just, no, it's a battle. It's a battle for every person. Don't toy with it. Don't fiddle with it. Don't play with it. Don't try to draw some boundaries, but absolutely ask God to root it out of our lives. We are to be completely and utterly merciless against sin. Not against sinners, but against the sin in our own heart. We're just to deal with, and sin in, in the group when it won't be dealt with. We'll cut to that in a minute. If we are casual and we are careless with our own sin, then we will tell others their sin doesn't really matter that much. We'll, that's what's going to happen. When we say, oh, I'm not going to have to, I'm not, I don't want to really deal with sin in my own life, everyone else will see that they don't have to deal with sin either, especially those under us, our children. Are, and that's a major stumbling block, a scandal. And yet you see in this section, holiness isn't really about you. 
you have to deal with personal holiness, but holiness isn't really about you. We pursue personal holiness for the sake of others. Scandals or stumbling blocks, he says they'll come, intentional ones or not, but they come from self-love, from self-promotion, and our general disregard for anyone but me and mine. And they emerge. These things emerge when we try to race to the top, make our desires primary. For you who are younger, you'll understand this particular illustration, a very quick one. It's like playing Mario Kart when you throw a banana out the back and you make the person behind you stumble. If you're older, it might be more like Herbie who drops an oil slick behind him in a race. Anybody know Herbie? Okay, I got a few nods. I may be too old for it. Okay, there's a couple. Herbie, the talking car, right? Or the, the car, that, it's that thing. you causing someone else so you can win. You cause other people to stumble. Or maybe in your pursuit, you're just dropping things out of your life. I do it. We do it. We're, we're trying to do things and we say things we shouldn't say. We do things we didn't do. We neglect things we should take care of. They're just stumbling blocks. We're constantly dropping behind us because we're just worried about where we're going, how we're going to get there. That's what carelessness about sin does to people in, other, in our lives. Again, not direct, not always immediate. It becomes where people lose faith and, and stumble and become destructive. See, when sin grows unrepentant in people, in this metaphor of cutting off body parts, it applies also, here, so here's the second way this, this text applies. It does apply to removing people at times from fellowship to keep them from leading others into temptation. We're going to see that, how that plays out later in the chapter. And this is a, a terribly painful and horrible process, avoided if at all possible. And even then, we have to be extremely prayerful and thoughtful. The conflict should not take the form of king of the hill. And we'll see that again, like I said, in a few minutes. There is not greater, there is not greater than others here. I mean, that, there's even a warning. If you look down, in other words, there's no one on top. And, and when, you, when, you, when you do this way, there's no one on top. There's not supposed to be some head who is kind of the access gate for everyone else to access God. That's not the point of what, he, of what he's saying and what he's going to talk about. There's this humble warning in verse 10 about humility. If you look down, if you despise, which means if I take a superior view over someone as though I am not going to allow them to access God, if I become such a stumbling block to people, if the church itself becomes a, such a stumbling block to people, there, is, there are angels in heaven actually have, give them access to God. They they're have access. In other words, none of us are what can keep other people from God. We're not their patrons. Nobody's a patron in here. In other words, it takes it and says, in any way that I am a leader or great in the kingdom, it comes from being a servant and a pursuer and not an overlord over people. Even when we have to deal with discipline, it's done from underneath. It's done from love. It's done from consideration and not from just trying to keep order or, or, or make everything just right. A legalistic kind of Pharisaic look at this. When I read this and how much it's about others, and Jesus is all about others, and we have to take our own sins seriously. When I think about this, my mind goes to King David. The King David story is just absolutely fascinating. King David was essentially the greatest in that kingdom, in the kingdom of Israel, but he used that position to feed his lustful desires for Bathsheba, and in his cover-up to plot for her to kill her husband, all of this sort of horrible stuff is, is all wrapped up in his life, it split up his family. It caused people to lose faith in his kingship and in kingship in general. It hurt countless lives. And after he was in, you know, Nathaniel came to him and talked to him and showed him the error of his ways, what did he do? He, he came and he tore his clothes off. He, he cried. He wept. He wanted that ripped out of his life. And I read Psalm 139, especially at the end of it, as this repentance and reconciliation that a realization that he has been given power and a kingdom and, and he's really hurt people with it. And he cries out in Psalm, I take it as a cry out in Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Try me and know my anxious thoughts. Here's, here's where personal holiness becomes about others. And see if there is any hurtful way within me and lead me in the everlasting way. Tear that, those things out of my life that are destroying the people around me. That's his prayer. Lord, take those things from me. Let us, Lord, let us know. Is that your prayer? Lord, let me know if there's any hurtful way within me and help me purge it out of my heart and lead me in the everlasting way. Whether that be a, something that is a heart that is controlled by sin or a heart that's controlled by legalism. Legalism can be just as tripping up to people. Is there something in your life that puts something in the way of others finding hope and faith and love? Let us all keep seeking him as we move on to what I call the meadow of hope. Kingdom greatness is nearly a, scand is a, is a nearly scandalous pursuit. You might call it a scandalous pursuit of the lost. Kingdom greatness is a pursuit of the lost. Now we're on to the story about Jesus, right? Or, or about the shepherd. And the shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them goes off and, gets, and wanders off. Jesus tells his disciples, again, this kingdom is like this shepherd who pursues one, one sheep. What an amazing love Jesus has for us. The, the scandalous part is that you're leaving 99 and going after just one. I think it applies in two ways, again. It applies to a lost humanity, in other words, cosmically, but it also applies in our attitude toward those who have wandered. And it applies to those who have been disciplined or are going through discipline in the fold of God. These three sections go together tightly. Jesus' emphasis, how his people treat, emphasizes how people, how Jesus treats, how we treat one another, the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to talk about that pursuing those who've wandered away this morning. When someone is removed from fellowship or just wandered away, maybe they wandered away because they were hurt, maybe because they were hurtful. I've had to deal with that several times uh, in my own ministry where people were being very, very destructive, very, very hurtful to other people to the point where they weren't going to apologize, they weren't going to repent, and had to be asked to move on. And that is one of the most difficult things to do. But I, I, sometimes, you know, when that person who's been hurt you, have any of you had anybody hurt you before? Have, have you ever had that person just leave? What do you feel? Relief. That's the natural thing we feel. But what does Jesus say? That person who's wandered off, what are we to be doing actually? Even if we have to deal discipline and cut them off from the fellowship or our own fellowship, what do we have to do? You know what you do if you're on Facebook? You put, their, you put this little thing up there that says, finally got somebody out of my life, right? As though, you know what? When people are just not treating you the way you want, just cut them out. Feel so good, you need to just, you know what, if you're having trouble in life, just start cutting people off that give you a little bit of trouble that are not as nice to you or don't, especially those people who don't reinforce every fantasy about yourself, every idea of highness that you have. So when someone says you, you probably shouldn't do that, you just need to cut them out of your life. Makes, makes everything fantastic, especially the mean people. You know what they just told everybody online? They said, disagree with me and you're gone. That's what I, I, that's what I see when I, when I read that. Maybe it's too harsh. We aren't supposed to be the church with that attitude. Or Christians with that attitude. I don't think we are. But this is generally speaking. That's not what church discipline is about. Jesus pursues the scandalizer, the troublemaker, the wanderer with a scandalous love. It's scandalous because we're taught utili what's called utilitarian ethics, which means you do what's best for the most people. That's generally how people think that that's wise. And we think, 
well, they're dumb enough to wander off. They were, they were crazy enough to go that way. Don't, the shepherd, don't leave us, or we don't want to leave the fold where we're safe and we're secure. Let them be. And Jesus says, all right, y'all stay right here. I'll be back when I find them. This is scandalous, like the cross. This is a scandalous pursuit of his people. The point is that all actions of God's people, even discipline, are supposed to be in the pursuit of redemption. When you're in conflict with someone and you're dealing, and I'm, I'm going to generalize, it's too specific almost for our case, our personal cases. When you're dealing with conflict with someone, the point of the conflict, the dealing of the conflict is to deal in reality with the issues at hand for the purpose of redemption and reconciliation. We're supposed to keep pursuing people for Jesus. That's exactly what you expect from Jesus, isn't it? When you've walked away and we walk away or someone walks away, we know Jesus hasn't given up on them. And Jesus is saying, you don't give up on them either. The whole 99 should be pursuing again, following the shepherd, looking for the lost sheep. Paul says the cross was foolishness to the Greeks, that it was a scandal, a scandal on a stumbling block to the Jews. His love and his pursuit of his people is beyond what we would find safe and rational. It was his pursuit of you to go find that one lost sheep. And if you don't know him right now, he is pursuing you and saying, I want goodness and wholeness. I want you to be a part of my kingdom. I want you to be a part of that. And I want you to do that now. And all of we're pursuing together. We are pursuing you. We love you as his sheep. And Jesus is in pursuit of you. This parable has had a massive effect on many institutions, including groups like the Marines. The Marines have a pretty intense, no man left behind mentality. There are several reasons for this. And I think some of them are obvious, like uh, people want their remains to go back to their families rather than to be left overseas or on enemy territory. But there are tactical reasons too. If you kill or wound a Marine, you know they're coming back. And that gets in the enemy's head. When the devil comes and he tries to yank one of us out of the fold and he tries to pull on us and tempt us, he ought to know that the other 99 are coming. That they're coming back. But if we just let them go, one by one by one, he will pick us off. And he will take us until we're down to two are remaining in the flock and one goes away and we're still going, well, statistics say we're safer with two. Seems like what he's doing in our world right now is picking off people one by one by one. Jesus calls us to the scandalous pursuit of his sheep and he calls us to think with that same scandalous logic, to pursue with an extreme love. I think you could apply this to many different kinds of folks. The, the, it, those who've never met Jesus, we pursue them. Those who have left churches either hurt or being a hurtful person. And a lot of, some, a lot of times, and I hate to say it, we're both when, when we've walked away. Not always. Sometimes we just get out before it gets crazy. Been there too. Sometimes it's the abandoned. Sometimes it's those who've said a prayer that they want to follow Jesus, but no one pursued them. No one cared. Ooh, they said a prayer. Ooh, they got baptized. But they've never had and known what it's like for Jesus to absolutely pursue them. We have a lot of folks that we can consider when we start to thinking, who, who, who in my life can I, pursue, can I just, tar we can target and pursue. So how do we balance this intense call to holiness with the pursuit of the lost and wandering? There's this dichotomy here, this kind of strict cut off everything that's not holy and this pursuit of those who are living without holiness. And that's when we enter the wise woods, what I've called the wise woods. 
Jesus lays out those basic facts when he says, if you have conflict with someone, you go to them and you talk to them. And if that doesn't work out, what do you do? You get two or three more together and you come together and you get the facts and you get everything and organized and you confront them in love, trying to redeem them. This is not coming together. This should never be. And I see it so many times. I've seen it so many times. People coming together and it is a conspiracy against someone. It should not be that. It has to be a conspiracy for them. Jesus lays out these real basic facts. Go in person to try to heal the situation. And if that doesn't work, again, it's time for a conspiracy. Kingdom greatness conspires for the sake of others. He tells them to get another person again and go confront them. You know, the world teaches us to build our kingdoms with conspiracies against. That's how you build a kingdom. That's how most people have always built kingdoms. They conspire against this or that. And he says, no, I'm building my kingdom by conspiring for people. Conspi- he teaches them how to conspire to help people, to build people, to win people over. This is the politics of Jesus. The word politics literally means influence. This is the politics of Jesus. If the sinner will not give way to a conspiracy of care, he says that you'll have to let them go and let God deal with them in, that, in their time, in his time. That's essentially what he's saying. It's, it's this balance of, discipline, of holiness and pursuit. This, this wise woods, as I've called it. It's basically, when you start to think about it, so many threads are coming together from the Old Testament to the New. It's basically the Old Testament job of the priesthood, right? If you don't know what the Old Testament job of the priesthood is, you may not know what I'm talking about. So the Old Testament job of the priesthood was to lead God's people toward the holiness of God. They had to deal with discipline. They had to deal with making sure people knew the law, that they had these things. They would lead the people toward the holiness of God. They would sacrifice and do all of those things while also representing God's loving pursuit of his people. And so we are called a what? A priesthood of all believers. This is the job of all of us. To be concerned both about us going and moving toward the holiness of God, but also being a God representative of pursuing people for his love. And the central place that this took place, the central place of the priesthood was the temple where God dwelled. Now this is all going to come together rather nicely in just a moment. Let's look at this really dramatic twist. Let's read 19 and 20. I intentionally let them all, uh, left them off. 19 and 20. He says, again, I say to you that if two of you, back to two coming together, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where? Two or three have gathered together in my name. I am in their midst. Where is God's blessing and power? It's where God's people conspire together. This is the center of God's work. This is magnificent. Threads, again, all over scripture, merging. Look at the words of 19. If you have your Bible out, can you throw 19 back up there? Look at the words. We have people that, we have essentially a prayer, right? Coming together and, and they're asking God for something. We have a prayer. And he really specifically tells us on earth, we have the Father in heaven. This unity of mind and heart in Jesus is on earth as it is in heaven. It is where God does his kingdom work. It's where he answers that magnificent prayer, the Lord's prayer. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come, or make your name holy on earth as it is in heaven. All of these phrases are being wrapped up and met in this one moment. We find ourselves in a very interesting place. This bluff 
this amazing divine place, looking out over all the world. And we've come to Jesus in this prayer and we find ourselves in a place like Moses and Elijah had so recently been where James, Peter, and John had stared in awe at the Mount of Transfiguration where two were gathered with Jesus. Moses, bringer of the law, the definer of holiness. Elijah, the great prophet of God, seeking his people. On the Mount of Transfiguration in chapter 17, Peter thought he he might be the greatest disciple just to have witnessed that great event in the last chapter. And now he's being invited to the meeting. He's saying, well, you can be like that. You you come together and you bring this holiness and you bring this pursuit of God. You are in this conspiracy with the great divine, with God himself, your own Mount of Transfiguration. You think, oh man, if I could just see something as cool as the Mount of Transfiguration. That's what we think, right? If I could see something so cool as the Mount of Transfiguration, I'd believe a whole lot more. You're invited to it. You've been invited to conspire with him where two or more are gathered in his name. There I am also. You're called there. You're invited to this great time, looking out over the world for God's plan. Conspiring how he's going to take over this entire world with his love and power. This invitation isn't to be taken lightly. The invitation to such a sacred encounter comes through humility, discipline, and determined love. The greatest in the kingdom are found in prayer rooms and ministry meetings and in the sweet union of God's sheep conspiring for others and acting on it. Jesus invites us into the great conspiracy between himself, the Father, and the Spirit to build his kingdom. I see it around us. I see it when we go to the heights, planning, meeting, doing those things. When we're worshiping with them, we're conspiring for them, coming together in ministry. And they join us, and it is the Mount of Transfiguration kind of moment. I see it in the food pantries. We're doing ministry and we're conspiring and planning. When you're preparing the food, it's, it's not found in like these, they don't always have to be found in this amazing song and hymn in which you're screaming and singing this amazing thing. It's often found in the very simple act of loving other people. When we come together and we say, we're going to conspire for some people in our world around us. That's your Mount of Transfiguration. That's the moment when the Spirit comes and Jesus is present. Who can you invite with you? I talked a while ago, thinking about someone or some people maybe that you need to pursue, that you feel called to pursue. Do you have someone in your life that you say, I need to pursue that person? I also want you to think, who can I invite to pursue with me? Who can, who can help me through this time? Because we're not called to just come to do everything as sort of our own thing. It says two or more come together. Find somebody to come and help you pursue people who are lost and hurting, wandering. Especially if you've tried yourself, almost as follow the same logic as, as the conflict logic. If you've tried yourself and it didn't work, bring somebody and conspire for them. Do you know that person? Can you identify that person in your life? We must come together and you are invited to the great conspiracy.